All right, thanks for coming to my talk on Advanced Codable. My name is Ben Sherman. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at SubDigital, and you might know me from NS Screencast, where I have over 400 screencasts on iOS development. And recently I launched CombineSwift.com. So if you're interested in learning about Combine, I would encourage you to take a look at that. I come from Houston, Texas, and that's about it for my intro because we have a lot to cover today. Uh, I wanna talk about Advanced Codable. And so I'm going to assume that you have a general knowledge of Codable and have used it before. Um, if you don't, you might find this guide useful. And I wrote this a few years ago, but all the content is still relevant today. And this will cover all of the basics. So the agenda for today is to recap uh, how Codable works, to talk about three advanced concepts and see how you can use them in your projects. So let's first recap what uh, Codable is and what it does for you. So here I have an example of say a beer social network where we're gonna be tracking our, our beers. And I wanna uh, take the JSON structure on the left and convert it into the Swift structure on the right. And because uh, these things are very similar. If you squint, they're basically the same exact structure. Uh, it actually just works because I mark this as codable and each one of the items in this list is able to sort of translate pretty easily between one and another. I can take the JSON instance on the left, convert it into the one on the right. And because the key names match up, everything just works. And so codable seems like really nice. I don't really have to do anything. I don't need to work with dictionaries in order to translate from a wire format, in this case, JSON, in most cases, JSON, uh, but it could be property list or XML or something else. Uh, and I don't actually have to write anything really custom. That is in the general case. So if we take a look at how we use this, we take that JSON and we either convert it into data or we already have data because we're getting it from the network. And we pass that off to a JSON decoder and then we tell it to decode a specific uh, instance of this type. And it's important that we're specifying the actual type that we want because the compiler uh, is going to be looking at that type in order to match up the properties of the type uh, with the structure it sees in the JSON. And so in code, that ends up looking like this, where we have a JSON uh, piece of data, and then we create our JSON decoder, and we tell it to decode uh, an instance of beer.self from that data. Now, nowhere in here did I say that here is a mapping between the Swift keys and the JSON keys, and here's how you decode this type and that type. It just works. So is it magic? Well, it's not magic. In fact, it is just compiler trickery that is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you um, because it is so easy to look at the two and infer what that implementation should be. But often we have to customize this. And so I'm going to uh, make, the, make the case that it is worthwhile for you to know exactly what the compiler is generating for us. Um, and so we can use that to customize it to our needs. So I want to take this pretty empty, simple beer codable struct and convert it into one that implements specifically the codable implementation. So the codable implementation is made up of three parts. There's the coding keys, and this tells us how to map between keys of the JSON structure and the Swift type. And again, I keep saying JSON structure, but it, this is generic, just 99% of the time we're working with JSON. And uh, after the coding keys, which is usually implemented with an enum, we have a knit with decoder, and then encode to encoder. So on our beer struct here, we will uh, give ourselves some room and add the coding keys implementation. So this is an enumeration with a string raw value and that conforms to the coding key protocol. And we add a case for each one of our properties. And because we said that this is a string backing value, uh, we get the, the string value of this for free. So the case ID is backed by the string ID in quotes. And that's where this Swift or rather the JSON key names come from. And if we don't specify all of the properties of our beer type here, uh, Swift will actually not compile because we haven't completed our codable com uh, conformance. So we need to make sure that all of our properties have a key here. Next, we implement the initializer init from decoder. Uh, 
Now, the first thing you always do here is to take that decoder and get a container keyed by the keys we just created. We'll talk more about uh, containers in a second, but this is a very common first line that we'll write. Then we use that container to decode uh, specific types at those specific keys. So I'm saying at the key ID, I want to decode an integer and I'm gonna store that in my ID property. I'll do the same for name, decoding a string at the key name, and again for brewery. So if you look at this, this is very kind of uh, mechanic. You can see exactly that the key names match up and the type names match up the types that are in our property uh, properties. And so you can see how the compiler could generate this. Now let's look at the encode method. The encode method is very similar. It's just the kind of mirror image. Now we get a container keyed by coding keys.self, but this time uh, we write into it. We say container, please encode the ID value on our instance for the key dot ID. And then we do the same for name and the same for brewery. And then this time the type is inferred because it knows what Swift type we're working with. So that's all there is to uh, customize the conformance of the codable and do it manually. And we do this because anytime we want to deviate from these norms, we're going to have to do this anyway. So let's talk quickly about containers. There are three different types of containers uh, that we need to be aware of. The first is single value container. So that's things like the string hello, the number five, the Boolean value true. Then there's keyed containers, which you should be thinking about objects. Objects have keys and the value of, in that key can be anything else in here. It could be another object, could be a single value, could be an array, etc. And then we have unkeyed containers. Anytime you hear unkeyed containers, you should be thinking array. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, something that might come up when our JSON structures don't match necessarily with what we want our Swift types to be. So let's do a demo on changing hierarchies. So here I have a JSON example that has some extra hierarchy that maybe we don't want in our resulting type. So we've got, for our beer instance, we've got our ID and our name, and then we've got a nested object brewery that has ID and name as well. And the type that we want to decode just flattens this out into ID and name for the beer, and then brewery ID and brewery name for the brewery. So how can we make this work? This is one of those cases where we're going to have to implement Codable ourselves. So we will start by creating our coding keys enum, which is a string uh, backed enum that has coding key as its protocol. And then here we can pass in ID and name like this so that these are the two coding keys that come from here. But then we have another set, another container, and we're going to need coding keys for that as well. So we'll call that brewery coding keys. And I will put the ID and name for that nested container inside of there. So here, if we look at this coding keys, it refers to this outer container of keys. And notice that we have a key of brewery that we need to put in there. So we add that into here. And then inside of brewery, we have ID and name here, and that refers to this brewery coding keys. Now for this example, I'm only going to be doing decodable because the encodable side, once you've done decodable, the encodable side is kind of like the reverse of that. So we're just going to focus on the decoding part of this. So we need an init from decoder here. And the first step for these is always to create a container. So we're going to get our container, which is try decoder container keyed by our coding keys enumeration. Then we can say that our ID is try container decode. Uh, our type is int.self for the key ID. And then for name is try container.decode, string.self for the key name. Now, what do we do about the brewery? In this case, we want to ask our container to give us a brewery container. So we'll say container nested container. Now, make sure we get the one that is keyed by something so we can pass in our coding keys. This is our brewery coding keys.self. And then the key that we're going to be looking for is brewery. So we're going to be looking at this key and pulling out a container that is keyed by this. So that is this key pulling out a container that has its keys, ID and name that are represented here. Now we can say that the brewery ID is try 
brewery container decode string.self in this case for the key ID. And then the brewery name is try brewery container decode string.self for the key name. Now, if we've done this correctly, it should decode without error and dump out the results, and it does. So that's an example of taking uh, extra hierarchy that we don't need in the JSON and flattening it out into one object on our side. Okay, in this example, I want to take a look at a JSON structure that is uh, representing a flattened structure. And let's say we wanted to nest these two things in their own object. And so I have a modeled a brewery struct and a beer struct and the beer contains a brewery. So how would we do this? The, we have two different hierarchies here. The first thing to do, is, again, is our coding keys implementation. So we can do that here. And if we look here, the keys inside of the beer uh, object itself, the things that relate just to the beer are ID and name. And I want to defer to this brewery over here for its keys. So over here, we can use an enum coding keys as well. And here we have a case of ID and name, but the keys don't match. And so we can override those and say that this is brewery underscore ID and this is brewery underscore name. Okay. So now what I want to look at is in this case, uh, we'll have a knit from decoder on our beer instance here. We'll start like always with getting a container, try decoder container keyed by coding keys.self. Then we can get the ID and the name pretty easily. So we'll say ID equals try container, decode the int.self for the key ID, and then name equals try container.decode the string.self for the key name. Now, how do we delegate from this point onward to the brewery instance? Before we use container.decode and because container is a keyed container, it's expecting us to pass in a type here. So I can't say that I want to decode brewery.self because I would need a key to, to reach into. And that's not how it works. It's a flattened uh, response. So instead, what we can do is we can actually just take our decoder that we have here because this is sitting at the same level as our beer instance. And so now we can say brewery equals try and just use brewery's initializer that takes that decoder. And so this is going to pass it along at the same level. And this one will decode using these custom key names, but otherwise is the same. So if we run this, now we have taken the flattened JSON and we've introduced our own hierarchy so we can organize these things into types however we see fit. Okay, now let's take a look at a deeper example. This time we want to look at heterogeneous arrays. Okay, so here let's look at an example where I'm modeling a feed of items and that's an array. And inside this is a bunch of items that share a similar structure but have their own type. So this is a text feed item that has some text and this is an image feed item that has an image URL. So I've modeled this by having a base class called feed item, which I said is decodable. And that has the type, the ID and the date on it. And then I have subclasses for each one of these. Now it doesn't compile yet because anytime you're dealing with decodable and inheritance, uh, the subclasses have to implement the uh, init from decoder um, because there's no way for the compiler to synthesize this for us. So we're going to have to do that. Um, but if we take a look, uh, let's just comment those out for a second. If we take a look down here, I've got my feed that has an uh, array of items. Each one of those is a feed item instance. And then I've got my JSON decoder and I'm using this key decoding strategy of convert from state, snake case, which is going to handle things like this uh, automatically converting into this image URL here. And then I also have the date decoding strategy of ISO 8601 to decode these string date formats into an actual date instance in Swift using the ISO 8601 date format. So if I run this, it does work. However, the problem is, is that each one of these items is an instance of the base class, not the specific subclass that I want. So it's missing the actual text uh, property from this one, and this one is missing the image URL. So that's not what we want. And so we can start by implementing our decodable conformance for these two subclasses. So let's create an enum for the coding key and then we'll do our init from decoder. We'll start off by creating our container keyed by codingkeys.self. 
And then here I can just specify that my text decoding string.self. And then because I'm inheriting, I can say try super.init and pass the decoder over to the super and it will fill in the blanks from the super class. So we basically need the exact same pattern over here for the image one. And so I can just change this to image URL and then we will change the text to image URL here and here. And instead of a string, we're going to be decoding a URL. Okay, so I have the codable implementations for our subclasses done. Now let's, let's talk about how to decode this items array. Now we're going to have to go over to our feed here and implement our coding keys enumeration with a case of items and then init with or init from decoder. Again, like always, we will get our container keyed by that coding keys protocol. And now container dot, what do I do for that items uh, array? Because it's an array, we want a nested unkeyed container for the key items. And that's going to give us our items container. Now it's important this is mutable because we're going to be uh, using it in a way that advances it. Every time we decode from it, it's going to advance its pointer into this array. So for instance, when we start, it's going to be pointing at this first one. And when we decode it, it's going to advance its pointer to the next one. And so we just basically need to keep decoding until it's done. So we go over here and we say, okay, while not items container dot is at end, let's decode something. But here's where we need a little bit of a curveball, And that's because I want to decode this first to peek into this type property. And then I'll know what type I need to decode and I want to decode it again. But there's no such thing as like rewinding or decoding in the same place again. So what I actually need are two different containers pointing to the same one. So I'm going to create a copy. I'm going to use the first copy to decode and look at the text or look at the type rather. And then the second one is going to decode the actual instance that we're inter interested in. So let's go over here and we will create an items container copy, which is equal to items container. We're also going to need an items array, and that's going to be an array of these feed item instances, which is initially empty. And then when we're all done with this, we need to make sure and assign it to that property. Okay. So we first need to peek at the type. Now for the coding key, normally we have a coding keys enum, but this is a case where I want to have something a little bit more flexible. And so I'm going to create a struct called any coding key, which implements the coding key protocol. We'll wait for the compiler to catch up and we will add the protocol stubs to implement this. Now coding keys have string values or int values. Uh, but ultimately they need to have this string value set. So for the string value initializer, it's easy. We just assign it like this. For the int value initializer, uh, we're not necessarily going to use this, but if you were using an array and wanted to have uh, positional uh, indices, then you would use a coding key for the index in the array. In our case, I'm just going to say that the string value equals the string conversion of whatever int was passed in and that's good enough to get this working. Then for flexibility, I want to add an extension on any codable or any coding key rather. And I want to make this conform to expressible by string literal. That means we need to implement this initializer here, which will take a string and I can pass that off to self.init with the string value and pass in the value that we got. The only difference between these two is this optional here that this uh, class was going to return. And so I need to force unwrap it here. And so what that means is if we pass a string, it will convert it to a coding key for us and uh, make it a lot easier for us to work with. So let's peek at the type. So inside of our items container, I now want to uh, get a nested container keyed by any coding key dot self. So this is going to give us our type container. And then inside of the type container, I can decode a string dot self for the key. And now I can just pass in a string type. So this gives us our type. Once we have the type, we can switch on the type 
And here in the case of text, we know we need to do a text property. In the case of image, we need we have an image feed item. And if, if we get anything else, I'm just gonna fatal error because that's a problem. So here in our text instance, we'll get the text feed item, which is the, uh, we're gonna use the copy for this. So items container copy, decode, text feed item dot self. And there's no key here because we're in a uh, unkeyed container. And then we'll append that onto the end of our items array. Now we have the exact same thing for image feed item. So now we have uh, both of these items being appended onto the array when the type property is equal to image or text. So this actually works. And if we run it, now we should be able to see that the items in the uh, items array are actually instances of text feed item and image feed item here. And they have their other additional properties, text here and image URL here. So this is enough to get this particular example working, but it is quite a bit cumbersome to do this sort of thing. And there's probably a way we can clean this up and make something a little bit more reusable. Okay, let's talk about refactoring this example so that we could create something more reusable that represents the same pattern. So we're going to start by creating something called a, a decodable class family. And this type itself will be decodable. And uh, this will have an associated type of the base type that represents the base class we're going to be using. And uh, that base type must be decodable. And then we also need a static var for the discriminator to use, and this is going to be any coding key. So implementers of this will have to specify what coding key you can use to determine what type the, uh, the thing is. And then finally, a function to get the type for a given uh, instance of this decodable class family, and that will return a base type dot type which means some type that de, uh, that descends from this type. So this is a little hard to understand without an actual concrete implementation. So we're going to create an enum for the feed item class family. And this will be a enum that is a string uh, backing value. And the reason why I wanna do that is because so I can have the text and the image as cases here. And these also happen to uh, represent the type values that we'll be decoding. So this uh, needs to implement the decodable class family protocol. And what that means is we need to specify the type alias for that base type, and that's going to be feed item. Then we have our discriminator, and we can just assign this to the string type, and it'll figure that out for us. And then finally, we have this get type, and in here we can switch on self. This ends up being easier to write, so we have uh, the case of image and we have the case of text. So here we'll return uh, text feed item dot self and here we'll return image feed item dot self. Okay, so this is our feed item class family. And so this represents most of what we need to continue. So what I wanna do now is have an extension on keyed decoding container. And the reason I wanna do this is so that I can really quickly uh, take essentially all of this code that we wrote earlier I'm actually going to take all of this and cut it. I want to be able to decode uh, the heterogeneous array of that class family. So that's what I want to shoot for. So we're gonna go back up here and we're going to have a function on that container called decode heterogeneous array. And this needs to be generic over that family type. So this will be a decodable class family. And here we'll pass in family as family.type and then the key for key key. And then uh, this type of container is already generic over its coding keys type K. So that's all we need there. This throws and uh, returns an array of the family base type. Okay, so I'm gonna paste in what we had below and anything specific to what we were doing before, we need to switch up. So now that we are an extension on a container, we no longer need to ask the container to do it. This is just going to be self. So we're asking self for a nested unkeyed container for the key. And instead of passing in the key items, we need to use the key that was passed in to us. 
then this is no longer an array of feed item, but instead an array of family.base type. Here, when we're trying to decode the type, here we're going to ask the family to give us its discriminator. And instead of discriminating over a string, it's going to give us an instance of that family itself. So here, instead of type, we can uh, say family. And this stuff ends up being a lot easier because now we can get the type by saying family.getType, and we can get the item by saying items container copy. We can decode that particular type that we're looking for on the, uh, on the array there. And we no longer need this. We can say items.append that item and return items. Okay, so looks like we need a try there. And everything else looks good. So let's jump down to where we were using this. And I wanna be able to say items equals try container decode heterogeneous array. And we will pass in the feed item class family.self for the key items. Okay, and let's run it. And now we have the exact same uh, results. We have text feed item and image feed item with their respective properties, uh, but we've done it in a way that is reusable. So if we want to create another type of class family in a different project, uh, we would just have to implement this class family implementation uh, that represents what are the different types of items, this, this thing right here. In this case, we have text and image, and uh, what is the base type we're working with, and what key do we need to uh, inspect to know what type it is. Okay, let's take a look at one more quick example, and this is using property wrappers. So imagine I have a structure of JSON that looks like this. I've got name, date of birth, and joined at. And if you look at this, the date of birth and joined at are both dates, but they both have a different format. And so I can't just tell the JSON decoder what its date decoding strategy is. I need to essentially customize my uh, conformance of codable just for this one case. And it seems a little bit frustrating that we have to do that. Well, I wanna propose a solution to this problem and that is using property wrappers. So imagine we had something like this where we have a property wrapper called date value that is generic over some sort of type that tells it how to decode these dates. Here we have a year month day strategy and an ISO 8601 strategy. So a property wrapper is just a struct that is prefixed by this property wrapper enumeration and has a wrapped value, in this case, a date. Ours is also generic over this formatter type and it, um, it itself is codable and has a private value, which is some sort of raw value that comes from that protocol. So if we look at the uh, date value codable strategy protocol, this has an associated type for the raw value that is, when we convert a string to the wire format, what does it look like? In the JSON structure, it's often implemented as a string, but sometimes it's implemented as a floating point number or an integer. And so this uh, determines what type of raw value is going to go in the, in the uh, encoded format. And of course, that value has to be itself codable, which is why a raw value has to conform to codable. Then we have static functions for decode and encode to convert or marshal the value from one to the other. And so uh, we can plug in whatever strategy we want to convert a string into a date or a date into a string, and then that will be used um, at runtime. So our property wrapper needs to have an initializer that takes in the wrapped value. So this is what happens if I create an instance of this just in code and I give it a date, it needs to know how to create that property wrapper. So it calls this initializer. And it's our job to use that formatter to encode this value so that we have a raw value we can use to encode later. And then the reverse of this is true. When we're coming from the decoder, we need to create an instance of this and decode the raw value, then use the formatter to decode that into a date and a store that in the wrapped value. So going back to our example here, if we look at this, this is already decodable. And it's decodable because the types of the date of birth and the joined at properties are not dates. The types are the date value property wrapper, which itself has a wrapped value of date. So by doing this, we've actually avoided having to customize our codable conformance just for these small cases by leveraging property wrappers.
Now I'll include a link to this and all of the uh, source code for these examples at the end. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that sometimes we can find uh, little snippets of reusable functionality that we can use to uh, make it easier for us to customize our codable models. So some takeaways from this talk. Don't resist customizing co uh, codable conformance. I think that uh, this is sometimes a foregone conclusion that we will eventually need to do it. And if you wait, sometimes it can be really painful later on, especially if you have a lot of properties. I also think it's useful to look for ways of cleaning, cleaning up common patterns uh, and making them in a reusable fashion so you can uh, not only just tuck that code in a different area, uh, but you can reuse it across projects. Also think that it's uh, worth uh, using these techniques to make sure that your Swift types look like Swift types and look and feel like the Swift naming styles that you're used to and not let uh, weird or different API decisions leak into your application. For instance, if you have underscore naming uh, or you know weird or different key names that you don't necessarily want in your Swift types, I think the codable customization is a great way to translate between these two worlds, keeping the Swift stuff more Swifty. And lastly, I think it's important to experiment because uh, you'll only learn these things if you sometimes fire open a playground and start uh, you know running through examples and try to come up with solutions to some of these problems. All right, that's it for me. Thank you for joining me. And if you have any questions, I'm all ears.